Welcome to the IPX True North Podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Welcome, everyone, to a podcast with uh, two special guests of mine. We are uh, going to be discussing redefining the ecosystem of tomorrow. It's going to be a multi-part series. I'm Joe Anderson, your host for this podcast. Uh, with me today, we have Martin and Martine, and I'm going to let them uh, formally introduce themselves a little bit about their background, who they are, what what makes them excited about what we're talking about. So with that, I just want to say Martin and Martine, I've known you for a very long time. We've had some fantastic conversations over, honestly, the last decade. Some of them uh, have been heated and passionate uh, about where industry uh, was headed back then, where it's headed today. And having these conversations, I've, I've always wanted to record them. You two have known that. I said it before, we should record this stuff. It's an honor to, to be here with you on this podcast. I'm really looking forward to this series. Uh, so with that, thank you for joining us. And, and if you would, uh, just give us a little bit of background about who you are and, and kind of what your passions are in, in this topic. Yeah, I started my working career somewhere in the end of the 1990s in an environment of weapon industry. And then, of course, configuration management is there, is there everywhere, although I didn't recognize it then. So later on, I stepped over and then uh, somewhere about 23 years ago, I, uh, I started in where I'm still today, which is ASML, uh, that small uh, obscure company that nobody knows about, uh, but is now in the, uh, in the midst of, uh, of all discussions. Um, I started as software engineer and then basically rolled into configuration management, then kind of by itself. And then uh, I think in 2006, I stumbled into uh, Ken Black. I think uh, most people that know C, uh, IPX uh, know Ken Black. And that's how I really got interested into the, the details of configuration management. And since then, basically, it grew, it grew and it became more. And that basically led to the fact that I'm now, for several years now, one of the lead architects for configuration management in ASML. And that's why I know the other gentleman, Martijn, <laughs> because basically, he's my colleague over there. Yes, yeah. So I basically uh, fulfill the same role as as Martin uh, at ASML. But uh, before we met, I did uh, a lot of stuff, uh, all related to product lifecycle management or configuration management. So it was all interrelated. But only when I was at Philips, a project basically called configuration management was was uh, set up. And one of the things that we ran into was the language barrier. Uh, every department had their own language and we had to find a common ground and that common ground became CM2. And um, so we started figuring out how could we get everybody trained in CM2. Um, and so we basically uh, in initially asked for Ken, but we got Ray instead. Uh, Ray Rosny, which was was really great. Uh, we did uh, the first uh, four uh, courses, uh, and then a month later, we did courses five and six with a team of about 12 to 16 people at the time. And um, that basically yeah, fueled the, the entire project. And things that uh, took uh, months discussing suddenly took just hours. Uh, it's, uh, it was really helpful in, in moving forward. And then yeah, later, uh, uh, I think it was uh, during one of the conferences uh, and also uh, the CM2P uh, course, uh, I met uh, Martin and I thought, well, what they are doing, I think that's awesome. And then uh, via another route, uh, I was asked to do an interview at, at ASML and uh, in the end, everything came together. And now we're working on thinking some st some very uh, interesting and, yeah, to, in my opinion, very cool topics around configuration management. And I don't think many people put cool and configuration management in the same sentence. So There's three of them in the uh, universe, and we all happen to be on this call right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for our listeners, uh, thank you for the introduction, guys. Um, I, I had a feeling Martin and Martin would undersell themselves a bit, so I'm going to actually add on to what they said. And you know, for those of you that, that know me and have heard, have heard me talk before, I try to be tactful. Um, I'm not always that, that good at it. But these two individuals are uh, some of the greatest minds when it comes to uh, business model architecture. And when you hear words like configuration management or change management or product lifecycle management, some people are still, a lot of uh, people or individuals still uh, kind of put those terms in a silo. And, and they don't really understand what it means to an organization, regardless of size, but a, a large corporation, multi-sided global. When you start talking about business process, architecture, infrastructure, 
the whole model, that's your core. And a lot of organizations do that incorrectly. They don't invest in the resources. They don't invest in the modern processes. And that's one thing I want to, you know, first of all, ASML clearly is as some of the greatest minds I've ever met. There's an individual who's also connected with Martin and Martin. I hope to have on here one, one day, Arno, when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and kind of where that's going. Another just great mind in the field. But these two, when it comes to true architecture of your people, your processes, your systems, data interoperability, that's configuration management of all of that. When you talk about product lifecycle management of people, processes, systems, data, ensuring interoperability, these two are some of the greatest minds I've met. Had some great discussions, uh, you know, a lot of challenging discussions where you actually have to think. Uh, about the future, not just today, not just putting out fires. Um, so with that, um, hopefully that's a proper introduction for Martin and Martine. Um, they're always willing to share lessons learned, um, you know, uh, reach out to him on LinkedIn. I, I do know Martine has an excellent blog. If you're not following that, you should. Just uh, really great reads, really great um, kind of uh, virtual discussions and comments after that from some of the like-minded individuals that, that enjoy this stuff. But for me, it's a very, very important topic. Uh, that's why we're, why we are doing a multi-part series on this re redefining the ecosystem of tomorrow. And for this, this episode, what we're going to be talking about um, is CM2 baselines, you know, the magic behind that. We're going to talk about the core business processes, what that means to a, a large corporation and, you know, for me, I, I want to hopefully, much like our listeners, just sit back and, and learn a little bit from Martine and Martin, um, because these are important topics. You know, uh, many of you uh, listening today know your organization will spend money on IT tools and probably have been doing it uh, continuously over the last 15 years um, with marginal improvement at best. Um, you'll spend money on... Uh, new sites, new infrastructure. Uh, you might do some token trainings, but very few organizations actually invest in changing and evolving your business model. And at IPX, that's what we're about. That's how we help organizations is evolve. Um, so Martin and Martine, I'm going to shut up here in a little bit. What I'd like to talk about today from your perspective is the core CM2 business processes, how those help from an architecture standpoint as guiding principles. And I'd also like your perspective on the CM2 baseline. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you too. Can you, can you help break out that, that magic, break down the magic of the CM2 baselines, the core business uh, uh, operating standards and processes, and why is it important to a large corporation? And I think, as I mentioned in my introduction, I think it's also about finding a common language, a common understanding of what you're talking about. And I think what CM2, IPX with CM2, and especially the CM2 500 did is define cer certain operating standards with only a few words, actually. But it, it really describes the essence of a business um, and then helps you as a company uh, to identify what is relevant for you. Not everything might be as relevant to you uh, or you have to add your flavor to it because it's written in a generic way and you have to apply it to your specific business. But in the end, it's a very good starting point for getting everybody on the same page. And that's yeah, in, I think what it also helps is when I go back into how I started it and I come from engineering background, which I... I guess most people working in configuration management or in that area or PLM, most of them come out of an engineering background or are com completely always focused on engineering. And, and I, I still vividly remember when I did my CM2 courses, which is 2006 or something, really, really long time ago. And, and I know Ken was talking about the business processes and, and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, right. No idea what he was meaning. And I was like... Not very interesting. Uh, we we have we have products. Uh, we need to get products out of the door. So th that that whole CM2 baseline for products, uh, etc. That was that is what I went home, and the rest was basically going away. And as as years passed by, I 
I start learning th that true power of what the CM2 model actually really does. If you really, really start diving into it, it is it makes things generic. Everything that we we basically dream up in an engineering environment, and but we find more of guess logic, uh, like releasing information and that kind of stuff. It's it's generic, and by defining those core business processes and just putting in okay, here we have configuration management as a core business process, which all the other core business processes can run off. You can say it, but by showing it, and these are the other core business processes, uh, et cetera, that for me, when it, when it started to sink in, the importance of that, then you start looking around you and you can see the, the commonality in your company. Uh, a lot of companies are looking for commonality, reducing cost, uh, IT is one of it, but there is a lot of commonality also in processes and business processes. And what I see is everybody's focused on commonality in products, product development, uh, platform management, part management, but commonality on processes, which basically leads to commonality in your business infrastructure and your IT infrastructure. That's where the money is. That's where the real money is. But this is something that took me a long time to actually start seeing it was told it, i was trained in it didn't understand anything of it until you really get into those positions where you start seeing it why is it so difficult why is cm so darn difficult to explain to people that don't understand configuration management yeah and you know one i think it, it was cute martin that you censured yourself there um that was nice you used the word darn. So I, I'll give you a gold star after that. We can all chuckle on that one. Um, you know, and the commonality, that's a big one. Uh, that, that's a word where I think we know a lot of organizations struggle, right? And consistency. And Martine, one thing I'd like you to do is really break down from your perspective, what the definition of configuration management really is. Because I think that's where a lot of organizations still struggle. They, they see and hear that word configuration management and they instantly think all that is is getting an engineering change order out the door. And as we know for an organization, it's far, far much more complex. But I would like to know from your perspective, what is configuration management and how, how do you approach it? If I would have to define it, and I think I'm very close to what CM2 would define, the purpose of CM is to manage all uh, and I would say configuration relevant information because you don't manage all information. I mean, there will still be SharePoints, there will still be Excel files, but that will be lying around. That's fine. But all configuration relevant information needs to be managed, uh, especially if it impacts the product, the safety, the any quality aspects, uh, production, service, maintainability. Um, but also if there are any potential liability issues or uh, your brand recognition, all of that. Uh, if, if there is impact, then probably you have to manage that information in a controlled way. And I think what CM2 basically promotes is doing that through standardized uh, set of uh, tools and processes um, uh, by accommodating change. Uh, and I think what, what is key is that all of all the things you do to manage that information is to ensure the integrity of that information uh, to basically guard the enterprise. You, you are there to make products, to sell products or services or whatever it is that your money makes, uh, uh, your company makes money with. Um, but CM is there to protect that purpose that the company has. Uh, and I think in, the, in that foundation, I think is where CM uh, is, is key. And I think not many people realize that every single day, almost every person in a company is doing some part that is related directly to configuration management. And um, that can be that you are, uh, as an engineer, indeed trying to release a document uh, because you need to release drawing or you need to release something. It could be anything. Or it could be that uh, somebody in the supply chain is ordering a new part and that's going to use a certain document that is ne needs to be sent to a supplier. Or uh, the factory is building a, a, against a certain order and you have a certain result. You have an S-build that needs to be stored somewhere. So all of these kind of activities are tying back to configuration management in the end. And I think it's kind of interesting because, and I think we had a discussion, Martijn, uh, multiple times. It's, 
it's kind of interesting to see that that a lot of businesses struggle, have a lot of issues in managing stuff, etc. But they find it very difficult to see the solution in the configuration management area. They, they see so the, so configuration management pretty generic. Uh, it's uh, on one on one hand specific managing requirements, uh, make sure that everything is on the change uh, uh, all that stuff. But on the other hand, it's there to make you run more efficient. And getting that message across is yeah, it's kind of interesting that I think the problem we're facing is is that configuration management is not taught at any school. It's not part of your education, so you don't understand. What I see, most people are don't understand how CM can actually benefit, can help them. They only see it as a burden. Uh, and yeah, that is, yeah, that's, that's a pity because basically I think then CM becomes more of a struggle than actually that we are there to help you. Uh, that's a, it's a bit I like- I think by, de by default gets a negative connotation. I think everybody that hears CM or most people that hear CM think, oh, that's something that is annoying, that's boring, that is bureaucratic. It's, you can fill in the blanks. And, and I think a lot of people have that uh, standard link basically with CM, while I think um, I, the opposite is true, actually. I think yeah. if you do good CM, it's not bureaucratic. Um, it's not slow. It's not cumbersome. Good CM enables you to do change faster instead of slower. And, and, then, that's... and stepping back to the, this, the, the thing I mentioned before, the commonality in the business, what I see uh, in businesses is, is, is sometimes that, for instance, finance is taking over part of the configuration management uh, stuff. They, they don't call it like that, but they, they need to report out. They need to have money under control. So they are starting to put in processes in place and kind of steps, which basically is a part of configuration management. Because they do that, they first, they don't understand they're doing configuration management. So the solutions most of the time are not really, really ideal because it's not there. Forte, they are not trained for that. And on the other hand, it, it's really only tailor-made for the finance part. So going back to what you said, that, that, that complete business infrastructure, understanding your core business processes is also about what is the purpose of every core business process and then recognizing that part of CM and which part it will take over out of what traditionally is scattered around, well, if it's already there, eh, but most of the time, there's more CM in most companies, I think, than they realize, but they don't recognize it and it is scattered all over the place. Yeah, uh, so yeah it's nice if, if training is, and I know IPX, part of the, the pillars is uh, first train people so they understand. And, and yeah, I think that's absolutely true. If you, if you don't understand these principles and you don't recognize them, yeah, you can try to do anything on configuration management, but then it becomes really a struggle, which, we, which I like on one hand because it makes uh, makes me happy but uh, yeah and, and you two touched on some some things i want to try to circle back to and keep that commonality theme attached to it and then and what martine first described as understanding you know as as ipx has started using the word ecosystem we've seen a lot of organizations start to gravitate towards that it used to be enterprise um, you know, we're all familiar with the buzz that was once around the model-based engineering, model-based enterprise, systems of systems, um, and, and we know artificial intelligence and machine learning, and that's data interoperability, you know, broken down to its simplest form. When you talk about AI, machine learning, you're talking about data interoperability, data interchangeability, and, and the fluidity uh, amongst that, and the commonality. Um, and then when you talk about the model-based uh, ecosystem, uh, a lot of organizations are still uh, starting to realize what that means. And it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're a large organization that's grown through acquisitions. You have multiple suppliers all over the world. So that means not only do you internally at your organization have to have some sense of commonality as you grow. So when you're acquiring an organization, what is your core? What is what are you going to transition and or assess and then transition when you are joining and merging these entities? How are you going to uh, maintain that commonality? And then from a, the, the model-based perspective, how are you going to encourage your suppliers to change, right? And what standard are they going to follow? And two decades prior to me joining uh, ICM, which is now IPX, you know, I got it much like you, uh, Martine and Martin, you know, as a CM2 
uh, P early on. And, you know, I used uh, certain aspects of a CM2-500 standard to improve the organizations I was with. And then we started going with a larger model and, and no organization um, will most likely ever be 100% CM2 compliant. Right. Um, that's a, that's not a that's, goal. The, the goal is making money and being efficient. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a means to get there. It should never be the goal. Yeah. Exactly. And that's a big one. Um, and, and the other one that I, I talk about every podcast um, almost, and, you know, I'm sure some of our listeners are tired of me hearing it, but I think it's important. Martine actually had an article on it. It's also recalls, right? And quality escapes and quality defects. When you talk about, you know, a automotive OEM having a settlement for one vehicle for over a billion dollars, that's a lot. And I think as consumers, we've gotten complacent and as uh, professionals and as executives we have as well, because I, I, what I'd like everyone to think about is that one vehicle was found to be of, uh, at fault because of the way it was designed. What about all the other units that are in the field? Well, how are they going to take care of that? What's the cost going to be? And, and I, you know, I don't want to get into that too much, but we're, we've mentioned a lot of things and the importance is commonality, efficiency making money, safe product, commonality across your ecosystem, including your supply chain. Uh, for me, um, and that's interoperability at its finest, right? And, and that's kind of the gold standard of where I and where we work with organizations is get them to be as efficient as possible and understand that a lot, and some of it is taking the ego out of the way, right? You've got a lot of, a lot of intelligent individuals who've had advanced training but Martin, much like you have said, and we've got some exciting things we're, we're doing on, on the side uh, and hope to announce soon with universities. But most, most individuals aren't taught CM2 or any level of CM at all. And, and, uh, and they get thrown into an organization and they've got these detailed expertise. But when you talk about these core processes, that knowledge is lacking. And... Uh, and, and it's still a struggle with us to get executives to understand this, this is something you should invest in and it, it should be something you champion um, for continual improvement of your continual evolution of your ecosystem. On top of that, if you look at the, the world changing, as we always say, the world is changing very rapidly. Now, of course, of COVID and lack of personnel, lack of staff. If you look at machines, uh, all, all the things we make become more complex more interactions, more interrelationships, that's products. Organizations get way more complex. Our supply chain is, is directly influencing the way we design stuff. The, the fact that we don't have enough stuff in the field uh, for any given product to tr try to get your car repaired. It's very difficult to find somebody. So that basically means is everything gets more complex. I think for me, that whole configuration management principles, et cetera, is one of the most yeah, important ways to, to streamline your organization to be able to do this. Not having information floating around anywhere, not knowing what your processes are, not knowing what information will be flowing to another, uh, 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 to another part of your organization. Well, that maybe is your overall business process, but your information beneath it. Do we know the statuses of it? So that basically makes it, it's, it's an interesting to write. I see that with many people writing down a business process is, is quite easy. Just say it goes from here to there and then everything starts. Okay, what's the status of those data? How do you manage the data? How will that work? How, will, how do you know where it is? And how do you structure it? All that kind of stuff, it's easily forgotten. And as everything becomes more complex, well, it's impossible to keep that in people's brains anymore. Uh, we get, we, I think if you talk to, I think any industry at the moment, I think everybody's complaining about the fact keeping staff. So where, where I think in the, when I started, which is not the old days, I'm not that old, but when I started, a lot of the knowledge was in people's heads, but they were working for seven, 10, 15 years in the same location. They, they started in mechanical engineering, they stayed in mechanical engineer. I started as a software engineer, after seven years, I was still a software engineer. Uh, I grew in my profession. A lot of information is in my head. That worked. But now it's one and a half years moving over to the next job, which on one hand is great because 
you need to have wide perspective on how businesses work. On the other hand, what is, where is all the information, all the knowledge I have? Where is it? And that also makes, going back to efficiency, you can have very good business processes. If you don't have that underlying fundament, then it won't, it won't work. Break, and, I, and I think if we look around us now, you can see it more and more breaking. And I think even size of a company matters in this case. It has an impact. I mean, if you're very small, if you're a startup, uh, there's only a few people, then collaboration between those people and the fact that you uh, talk to each other every single day is probably mitigating a lot of the problems. But the bigger a company gets, the more complex these interactions become. And uh, you might not know the person that's going to use your data, or at least not all of them. So how do you ensure that whatever you create is indeed what all those people need? And I think that's um, something that is is, is, is always difficult, uh, especially where the, there's more focus on the, the development, on the, the, the breadth of the, the people and not so much on the depth, uh, so to say. Um, and I think there should be a much more a balance. Uh, yes, you should understand engineering and manufacturing, because if you're an engineer that doesn't understand manufacturing, then what are you doing? Because you, you're designing a product that has to be built. And if you don't understand how manufacturing builds it, how can you design your product, right? So I think you have to understand both of those worlds. Um, but as an engineer, I do expect you to be able to go really deep in, into your expertise, to really know uh, everything about uh, a certain topic. If, if you're an expert in uh, fluid dynamics, then I, I, also, I do expect you to know almost everything about that topic and not just the few basics uh, uh, maybe, right? So I think there's a, there should be a real good balance. But then I circle back to your first question, uh, Joe, because you basically started with the, the, the business infrastructure and the baseline. I think what Martijn is now touching upon is if you look at how do you make sure that people can cooperate? How do you know that they can find information? How do they know they how to reach out? I think in the mid-center is that beautiful, for me, crown jewel of, uh, of the CM2 model, the CM2 baseline. I think that and baseline not only for uh, product information, uh, but that is where most companies, I think, will start because it's, that's where it's most tangible, where we already have the systems. Baseline also for processes. Uh, but that, that, that baseline, like an, how do you call it, the, that red line through your whole company, which basically ties everybody together. By, by the data they, everybody generates, by ownership. Um, I think that helps really in, in those companies that grow or when everybody works from home. Uh, you get now companies that basically have staff all over the world. You don't have to be in the same building anymore. But that basically means that you have to figure out who owns what, what is linked, who do I have to reach out to? Uh, um, and that also helps in, in complexity. Because I think, Martijn, you're absolutely right if you state like, I have this, this guy who's really, really into fluid dynamics. If I start asking him to also think about, let's say, uh, safety or, or uh, the, does your design, whatever other uh, aspect, uh, take it in consideration, that's too much. You have to help these people to, to, to show them in, in their faces, hey, here's a relation to this data, but this data basically is a person. You have a relation with him, go talk to him. Go talk together because although everybody thinks information and you have to link information and then uh, you, you make it visible, actually you're linking people. Yes, I think yeah. in, the, in the CM baseline, all the linkages, I think the, 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 fund, the fundamental CM is about linkages, uh, linkages between data. Um, but these linkages in the end are required interactions between people. And it's so, and I think a lot of people don't understand that when they look at a computer screen and they see all kinds of relationships between all kinds of nodes, they don't necessarily see that's an interaction that I need to have with somebody else. And, and I, I think that is really important because every data set or every set of information is owned by somebody. Somebody has created it. Somebody is maintaining it. There are people that's going to use it. So there is, by definition, creator and a customer, right? And it doesn't seem to create a user kind of, a situation going on that, that has to be managed and people have to be able to be involved uh, whenever something is going to change. Um, and I think creating something initially, releasing it initially, using it once, etc., that's relatively easy. But it's never like that. 
I mean, before you have actually built your first product, you probably have done a ton of changes on that product documentation because you learned all kinds of things during a, doing a, a small prototype of doing a, even a virtual prototype. Uh, you already learned so many things that you have to process already a, a lot of change before you actually start building the first units. And doing change is when things become complex because doing change requires much more interaction um, than just an initial buildup. Because during initial build-up, you, you agree on certain interfaces and you build according to those interfaces, etc. But then when you're doing a change, you might impact those interfaces. So suddenly you have to understand how that impact works. That means you have to talk to those people again. And it's not you cannot start to continue your design in holy isolation and, and hope for the best. It doesn't uh, work. Also, like that. Martijn, if you, if you talk about this, uh, talking about new de product development, basically everything is in line, is in order. Everything goes from the first person to the next person to the next person to the next person. Purely defined by processes, very simple, straightforward. As soon as change starts kicking in, you mess up everything. Now suddenly that, that fluid line through your company is being yeah, interrupted at each, every moment and every stage and nothing is, is clear again. And, and, and then, especially if you don't manage it, if you don't have a baseline and basically uh, in software, for me, the baseline was always, that is the thing you can grab. That is, you know, exactly what the baseline is. Uh, everybody's like, oh, I have a baseline. I know exactly what it is, uh, what is it all about. It's clear, it's, et cetera. And I think, especially if you want to manage change, uh, and yeah, without a baseline, I don't think you will ever be very successful in managing change. Uh, yeah, whatever. It's, it's, as a company, you want to manage change because that's how you make money. I mean, if you stop doing change, you basically say we're going to stop the business. Yeah. And that, and that's there's one area I want to talk about that we haven't touched on yet. Um, there's actually a lot here, and I, I I do think we'll probably have two parts just for this one. But when you start talking about the entire business, when you start talking about understanding uh, all of the impacts, uh, when you start introducing change. There's a couple areas that in my experience and, you know, at IPX, we see organizations truly struggle with, and that's logistics. Uh, logistics has come, become extremely complicated with large global organizations and with the pandemic and other issues, um, but also infield support, infield service. You know, from your perspective, what's the future? What should be the future of ensuring that when we introduce a change or we're going to introduce a change to design, we have to understand what that means to our service, uh, you know, in the field, at, at our customer location, regardless of your organization, regardless of the consumer or the, the OEM you support or large company, depending on what you make, such as ASML. I know you have some very complex service processes what what do you feel organizations are struggling with today and what's your perspective on tomorrow you know where should companies really focus and how should they bring in logistics how should they bring in that that service arm of an organization when it comes to commonality when it comes to uh, proper change communication when it comes to identifying your proper impacts I step think you one. already mentioned it, right? Step one, doing an impact analysis. <laughs> yeah, but doing an impact analysis is for me breaking silos. Yes. The, the whole thing boils down to break down silos. If you can't, if it, it starts from the from the very first start, it is cross cross sectoral, cross functional, uh, whatever word you use. From day one, you have to have that focus, but that also means that. Your logistical department and your your service departments need to work closely together with the engineering the other way around. And it is about you bring your own expertise. But again, I think what Martijn said earlier, it's about interrelationship. It's about communication with each other. Can I tell you from a logistic perspective to somebody that is designing something what I actually need? And can I tell from an engineering point of view what I need from a logistical uh, 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 environment, not only when we start doing something, also when we start doing changes. Impact assessment is the, is the magic word. Uh, that is something I think that configuration management drives doing impact assessment. But if those, uh, so if you don't have, if you still work in silos, um, yeah, first you don't have that, that great, uh, um, reuse through your company because uh, 
maybe manufacturing that has kind of same work instructions than, than uh, your service people use, but they don't know. They start changing them independent of each other. It's and I think you can already identify companies where the silo thinking is still very strong is when you still talk about an engineering change or yeah. an engineering change request or an engineering change order. If you think about it, it's, it's like you're only saying something is going to change in engineering which is absolutely not true because you might have to purchase new parts or you have to go even go to a new supplier and uh, you have to va uh, validate that supplier. You have to basically build something new or assemble something new in your factory. You have to validate it, test that. Um, all kinds of new stuff is going to happen all down uh, the, the value stream. And I think saying something is an engineering change is by definition already silo thinking. And I think we have to be careful. I think that CM2 did a, did a good job by basically uh, making it a change notice, or a, I think even in the, when I was was taught, it was called an enterprise change notice. But it, it already it doesn't say what the scope is. No. And I think enterprise change notice already is, is narrowing it down to the enterprise. And I think that's also not right because things might change to in your first tier, your second tier, your third tier supplier. Um, how do you manage that? How do you make sure that change is going to be affected on the right place on the right time and it's going to be successful? And to add to that, it's not only your product, it's also your process. Because most of the yeah. time, you see, if you can have changes on products, they will, they might be influenced by or influence others, influence processes, especially outside engineering. So if I design something completely different, I might need different staff in the field. I might need a different way of how we actually send people in the field. Let's assume we're going to do more sensors on our on our product and that basically means is we now can from remote uh, figure out that we need the preventive maintenance instead of just reactive maintenance but that basically means that i need to change my processes on my service department so making an engineering change basically that's what it's called that's what is recognized by the organization oh we're going to create a new product we're going to all look at the new product and then guess what we roll it out we figure it out our other, our, our other two big uh, parts of the company, they didn't change because it was an engineering change. It's not an enterprise, maybe universe change, but that makes it really, really big. But that, I think, you, Martijn, I, yeah, we, most of the time we agree, so that's easy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that notion of calling it an enterprise, of an, uh, sorry, an engineering change is, is one of the, yeah, the, it sounds simple. It, it looks very minor. And I think it's a really big thing if people understand up to management what the difference is. Yeah. And that's that's why, you know, you did see us just go to a very simple change request, change notice. And it's also why we, we went away from the industry norm of, you know, when we first deployed uh, CM2 uh, in the early 80s, you know, you had the problem report and, 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 in the last few years, we've we've changed because not everything should be a problem. And when you start looking at an, an IR, as we call it, it's that upfront container, the object, an investigation request. That could be an idea. It could be an engineering idea. It could be a finance idea. It could be new innovation. It could be someone on the floor. It could be a, a stranger. But it's it's giving you one repository to maintain all that information, regardless of what it is, it could be a problem, a potential problem. It could be an innovation, uh, but having that tied to the closed loop CM2 change process is something I'm really proud of. And I've always been a proponent of. And the, the one area that, that I think we'll probably get on uh, on the next series. And, and it, it ties back to what you were saying earlier about knowledge management. You know, with a large organization like ASML, where they encourage career progression, right? Or you have another organization or there's a high attrition rate or you have an influx of uh, new employees every quarter. There's there's an issue there with knowledge management for everything we've talked about um, in this episode. And and when I close this out, it's, you know, normally I don't do a plug. That's why we're really proud of the Idea Academy that we launched this year. And we're, we're still struggling to get organizations to understand it's more than just training. It's about functional knowledge management. How do you take the training? How do you apply it at your organization? How do you always have a, a, a way for, for your individuals to not only share lessons learned, to get those up skills, to um, 
have kind of uh, focus groups. And, and that's what we've done with Idea Academy, because for us, CM2 is the gold standard at CM2-500, all the certification trainings built behind it. I know Martine, you're a professional like myself. Uh, Dr. Hackett here is the CM2 doctorate. And, and we've all kind of dedicated ourselves to these issues because we are passionate about it. But we also owe the next generation a, a way for them to learn from us, right? So they don't have to learn from scratch. And that's why the Idea Academy was created because it is innovation driven by excellence and accountability. So you have training, you have knowledge management, you have these focus groups, you could do it internally, you could do it externally. But that's one thing I want to talk about uh, perhaps next time is your, you know, your um, perception on the impact matrix and how that could be used for knowledge management. That's most organizations don't properly use the impact analysis for product changes. I would like to really take it a step further with you two from an architectural standpoint and help organizations. This is something I believe, I think it was Martine, uh, Max, Paul, it's been many years ago, we were sitting in a restaurant and we are having these discussions being like-minded individuals for different companies. But for me, I've always been passionate about, okay, but how do we take, and, and Martin, you alluded to it, how do we use CM2 for that for the, the, the other side, the non-product side? How can we use that impact assessment for knowledge management and knowledge transfer and, and, and knowledge communication and storage and all of that and training and making it functional, but also making it somewhat enjoyable? And I think that's where you've seen a lot of companies struggle. They have static LMS systems that no one cares about. And I censored myself there, Martin. I was getting ready to really go off because that's an area where I think companies just do a, a disservice to their resources. You know, they they have these platforms that are really not functional and, and there's no commonality for those. So um, next series, keep that in your mind. Listeners, uh, uh, we've got a lot to talk about over this multi-part uh, uh, redefining the ecosystem of tomorrow uh, series. But again, Martin and Martine, thank you for joining. Um, it's always a pleasure. We've, uh, we just started this journey. I look forward to it uh, for our listeners. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. Thank you for taking your time. I do uh, highly recommend again for you to connect to these two individuals on LinkedIn and have have a look at Martine's blogs. Uh, they are a fantastic read, brings in a lot of outside industry expertise and ties it all together in a practical way, but also uh, with a view of the future. Um, so Martin and Martine, thank you again for joining me today and I look forward to uh, next week. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit IPXHQ.com.